today of our 17th annual Sharpen the Saw Day. I'm Peter Parts, an EMBA class four graduate and one of the volunteers who keeps this cool event going every year. We call it Sharpen the Saw. Remember yesterday, we talked about if your company is hiring or if you're looking for an opportunity. Jessica has sent out everyone a link to all that have registered. If you're hiring or looking, fill it out. We're going to do everything we can to help our EMBA brethren find opportunities. And remember, anyone who helps one of our EMBA family find a job opportunity gets invited to a picnic dinner with great wines and beers at my home. And I mean cold beer. I mean, we keep our tap at as close to zero degrees centigrade as we can. So if you wanna find out how cold zero degree centigrade beer it is, help somebody find a job. We had a great day yesterday with Pam Sherman talking about leadership and how we all need to present ourselves and our mission with passion, whether it's our work mission or our personal mission and how to find our edge. E-D-G-E, which she defined as explore, dream, grow, and excite. It was a great presentation, insightful and chock full of great thoughts and ideas. If you missed any of the talks yesterday or the day before, you can easily go back. Jessica posted a link in the presentations in today's Sharpen the Saw reminder. I would like to start out by introducing Rich Noter Giacomo who has been involved with the RIT Venture Creations Incubator as the director for many years. And he was Nick Kahn's incubator coach. They say coaches can't have favorites, but I know that Rich has been cheerleading for this product success for years now. When I told Rich that Nick would be speaking and would he like to do the introductions, he lit up and said, I would love to. So Rich, the microphone is yours. Would you please introduce Nick to our audience? Peter, thank you. Thanks a lot. Uh, thank you very much. Um, yeah, you know, one of the great things about working at Venture Creations is the many interesting people you get to meet in the course of um, uh, in the course of business. And one of them clearly uh, was our next speaker, Nick Khan, who I met about a year and a half or so ago. Uh, when he came to me at Venture Creations to talk about his business. And um, in our conversation, early in our conversation, I saw all the markers that I love to see when discussing a business uh, for the first time with a founder. Uh, these things are, you know, strong value proposition, the passion that Peter just alluded to, drive, uh, a willingness to listen and a willingness to even push back. I saw all of that and I encouraged him to apply for admission, which he was obviously granted, uh, never a question in my mind. And when it came time to assign him a coach, uh, which is you know kind of the hallmark of what we do at Venture Creations, I took the liberty of exercising the director privileges, which I had at the time, and I assigned them to me. Uh, I don't like to do that that often, but this is why I just had to, I had to have the opportunity to work with this guy. Uh, and, and my decision uh, to do that seems more and more correct as the days pass. What's interesting is I, what I didn't know about Nick was how early into his childhood, his entrepreneurship roots actually went. In fact, here's a warning. I want you all to be a little careful when you negotiate something with Nick, because my understanding is that when he was about eight years old, he conned, no pun intended, he conned his younger brother into signing a contract in which the younger brother gave up all his rights to a certain portions of the backyard. I would love to see the video on that one. Um, after that, he went on to set up a business where he designed and developed websites for others. And around the same time, built his own MP3 player because his parents refused to let him have one, ostensibly because they were concerned he'd spend too much time uh, with that instead of his studies. But frankly, I just wondered, Nick, if that refusal had anything to do with the contract you made your brother sign. Uh, Nick came to RIT knowing that he wanted to be in the medical products business. And at the time, RIT was the only Eastern University that offered a biomedical equipment option within an electrical engineering degree. In fact, Nick holds three degrees from RIT, including a BSEE, a MSEE, and a PhD in microsystems engineering. His PhD program, he worked with Professor David Borkholder, with whom he partnered in setting up this company. It was Dave who convinced Nick to stick around for the PhD rather than trotting off the industry, which Nick had intended to do. 
Another decision I say looks more right every day. I could go on, but I know you're here to listen to Nick, not me. So it gives me great pleasure to present to you Nick Khan, co-founder and chief science officer of Kasana Health, which may possibly be RIT's next unicorn. Nick, it's all yours. Thank you so much, Rich. That, that is probably the best introduction I've ever had. Um, so as Rich mentioned, I have been at RIT for a very long time and only in the recent future did I actually leave the campus to go set up shop in a nearby building uh, closer to MCC where we now have our offices. So today I'm gonna talk about uh, the origin story of Kasana and then get into what it means to take your idea and drive it and raise capital at a national scale with a top VC. Uh, and throughout that process, how do you grow your business and position it in a way that can interest those who are operating at the highest possible level uh, in the entrepreneurship world? So uh, Kasana started uh, as Heart Health Intelligence. That was the name of the company uh, as I formed it after my PhD. I had stayed at RIT. Um, as Rich mentioned, to get a PhD with Dave Borkholder. And early on, we had an opportunity to propose some research to Google. Google was interested in monitoring people in the home, specifically cardiovascular health. So we were brainstorming about what the biggest challenges are with medical devices, in-home technologies, wearables, uh, and it's that people don't use them. People won't charge them. Even the most well-meaning patients will forget or get tired of charging that Apple Watch every day and then it sits in a drawer somewhere or the blood pressure cuff doesn't get put on correctly. So we started brainstorming and I said, well, what about a steering wheel on a car or a you know, com uh, computer mouse? Well, those things are great. You get skin contact, people touch them uh, and they're usually pretty stationary but not everyone with advanced cardiovascular disease will use those devices. So I said, let's throw electrodes on a toilet seat and Dave, very shrewd, thought that was a great idea and then said, what if we put all these other instruments that I know about into the seat? And I'm like, well, I haven't heard of half of those, but sure, let's do it. I ran upstairs. I strapped electrodes onto my butt to make sure that, hey, you can actually measure something. Uh, we wrote up the grant and then um, actually it was probably only three months later that we received $1.6 million from Google at RIT to develop this technology. So uh, throughout my PhD, I built the toilet seat that monitors your heart health. And it measures a slew of different things from heart rate to blood pressure without a cuff, blood oxygenation, as well as something called cardiac output, which is how much your heart is pumping per minute. And um, it was of course very challenging. It was a highly scientific project. It was needed to meet the rigor of a PhD. Um, where I published multiple journal papers and ran human subject testing, uh, comparing the prototypes to various gold standards. And we partnered early on with a cardiologist at the University of Rochester Medical Center, uh, who is the, currently still the director of echocardiography at Strong, Carl Schwartz. Uh, Carl uh, was the perfect addition to the team. Dave, Carl, and I augmented each other so well and um, over the years, I built up the seat. We ran testing on over 300 human subjects. I published two peer-reviewed journal papers, um, as well as a few conference papers. And then uh, it came time to, to do what's next. I always knew, as Rich said, that I wanted to be an entrepreneur. So then came what I like to say is the hard part. As an engineer, it's very easy to solve technical problems. Um, even if they're challenging ones, it takes time, it takes dedication. Uh, but it's what my brain is made for. Uh, on the other hand, coming up with a business plan, pitching to investors, um, leading a team, you know, those are things that may come a little bit less easy to somebody who's more technically minded. Um, but as someone who had always been interested in this, I, I did my research. And <clears throat> after joining Venture Creations and working with Rich and, and um, leveraging the Rochester ecosystem, to refine my pitch, to, to make my value proposition more intriguing. Uh, I like to say that while Rochester investors, it, it, it takes a lot for them to invest a little. What they really, really help with is refining your plan, making sure that you're ready if you do go pitch elsewhere um, to wow everybody else. And um, it's challenging. Raising seed capital is challenging because 
many companies, many investors, uh, they expect you to have revenue. They expect you to have a big team, but that's what I need the seed capital for. Uh, so it's this chicken or the egg problem. And uh, I would argue that it's uh, increasingly challenging with medical devices where you can't just bootstrap. If you wanna go through the FDA, you can't just start selling product and seeing if it takes you know, hold in the market, if you'll get paying customers. Uh, you have to follow the regulatory processes. You have to make sure that your device is safe and effective and won't hurt anybody. Um, so from there, what I did was um, remain very tenacious. You get a lot of no's. Uh, and one thing that Rich told me, which always stuck with me was, you know, you're, you're refining your strategy, you're refining your plan, and it's a good one. And you keep getting no's because you haven't found the right investor yet. And that, that helped, that helped a lot. Every single no, it's like, okay, you're just not the right one. I'll, I'll keep looking, I'll keep refining. I'll, I'll take the feedback that you gave me and then go on and, and find somebody else to pitch to. And one thing that I will say that is a very challenging thing to do is strike the balance between being knowledgeable, being confident, uh, while also being humble and accepting what all of these investors are telling you um, and, and taking it in to refine your plan because you're asking them for money because they've been successful in one way or another. Uh, it's, there's respect, you have to have respect on both sides and um, going in and being confident is just part of the puzzle, uh, which of course you won't get very far if you can't pitch confidently because I, I swear investors can smell it if you're unsure of your idea. You have to be confident that you're gonna change the world and that you're gonna put your all in and, and make a difference. So having then uh, flown across the country, multiple different cities uh, from San Diego to Boston, uh, I eventually convinced Bemis Manufacturing Company to be our lead investor in our seed round. And for those who don't know, Bemis is the largest toilet seat manufacturer in the United States. Um, it was a, a, a very interesting match and they are located in Sheboygan Falls, Wisconsin. So Bemis uh, joined us very early. They led our round and then as things tend to do, they start to snowball. Uh, more investors wanted to participate in our seed round. Uh, you just have to find the one lead investor. And then from there, you, you show that lead investor to everybody else you speak to. And um, it's, it's like a surrogate for market acceptance at an early stage. So at that point, all of a sudden, what, what do I do? I am about to have $2.2 .2 million in the bank and I have zero employees. And uh, that's a, a, an interesting and it's a scary but great place to be. So luckily through Rich, I had formed a really strong advisory board um, when I was originally looking to replace myself as CEO. Uh, early on, I thought that I should be focusing on the technology, driving the innovation and working with somebody who has experience bringing, bringing a medical device to market. And uh, luckily a very amazing advisory board of, of which Rich was part of and um, convinced me, nobody can pitch this better than you right now keep driving it, keep going. And then when the time came, I wrote a job description for a chief operating officer and I was lucky enough to have one of my advisory board members say, hey, that could be me, what do you think? And then Ken Rosenfeld, one of my advisors uh, was my first employee. And he started a month before the first dollars rolled into the bank. And Ken and I worked on growing the business um, over the next year or so. And this was September of 2019 uh, that we started. From there, uh, it, was, uh, it was a wild ride of let's take this technology that was in a lab at the university and make it something that is a product, make it manufacturable, make it so that it's designed under quality controls for the FDA. Um, lessons learned here. You know, I, I've been compiling a list of all the things that I would do differently. And I'm very fortunate that that list is actually a lot smaller than I expected it to be when I started out. Uh, but that is in a big part due to the fact of, of all the help I had, all the people around me who, who gave me their hard lessons learned. So listen to your advisors. It's, it's challenging when, you're, when you have a number of advisors and they tell you different things, but try to understand uh, what, what the intention is. There is the whole you know, whiplash of, of, of having many advisors, but when leveraged correctly, I think that they can help you create a strong foundation. Um, one lesson learned, 
don't outsource something that's critical to your um, to your company. Uh, early on, I made I, I won't say the mistake, but it was something that we we struggled with for a while until we actually brought it in house, which is taking my designs and designing it for manufacture. Uh, the thought was we're small, we don't have experience with the FDA, let's go with a consulting firm who has medical device experience, who knows how to design products under a quality system. So we can just do it, have minimal friction from a quality and regulatory standpoint. Uh, and then we can take that, submit to the FDA and go to market quicker. And you know, while it's uh, more expensive using a firm, it in my mind reduced the risk quite a bit. Uh, while that is in part true, you end up needing to pull that in-house eventually. And you need to be able to build up the competencies of understanding your product, how it's built, especially in a regulated environment where you now have to go to the FDA and talk through, this is how my device works. This is why we know it's um, safe and effective. Um, and we have actually been working to bring in as much of the work that we've outsourced as possible since our Series A round, which actually has been going incredibly well. Uh, one of the other things that I will say is, is worth talking about when you take a, something that's a concept and you don't have any traction in the market, you don't have anything to show for it other than a few scientific publications or maybe even less, uh, raise a lot more money than you think you do. Uh, everybody knows that, right? That's, that's what you learn in Entrepreneurship 101. Uh, but everyone's lying to you because you need even more than that. You need like 2x more instead of the 25% more, 50% more that everybody says. Uh, you want to plan out two years plus of runway, no matter what your plan is, two years plus. Uh, things happen. COVID happened uh, right in the middle of uh, starting to plan our Series A round, COVID happened. And um, we were a new company. We had three employees at the time. And uh, all of a sudden, travel stopped. How do you raise capital in a world where travel stopped? where there is uh, fear and a lack of uh, investment going on and then uh, exorbitant uh, low valuations from investors who are just not really sure what's gonna happen in the next couple months. Staying firm, knowing what you're worth, knowing what your company's value is, is, is really critical. Looking at comparisons, and I don't mean just in your local city, look across the board, look across in Boston, in New York City, some of the bigger hubs, uh, compare yourself to your peers there. And that's a, a good way to make sure that you're not being uh, too hasty in accepting a, an investment. And I'm glad that we weren't. Uh, come the probably July, July timeframe of 2020, I was very fortunate to reconnect with Austin McCord, who uh, was the founder of Datto, which went public for four and a half billion dollars uh, last year. And Austin grew that company from his basement uh, in his parents' house, all the way to the company it is today, or he stepped away a few years ago um, when it was acquired by a private equity fund. So uh, Austin introduced me to the folks at General Catalyst. And boy, are they phenomenal people. Uh, one other thing that I will say that I've been very blessed with is to find really ethical folks to work with. I can't stress that enough. Um, it's It's a challenging world out there, but working with people who have a really high degree of integrity uh, make it that much easier because you're never questioning, uh, are, are, are they going to take advantage of me? Is, is, can I trust what they're saying? Look at their track record. Look at what they've done. Look at how they've treated those who have uh, gone before you. Who have they invested in? And General Catalyst, uh, I was surprised to see how stellar of a reputation they had with treating founders respectfully um, and, and really um, empowering founders to make their dreams come true. And uh, long story short, Austin has joined us as CEO. We are now working to grow the business um, to be something bigger than Datto, Austin hopes and believes is possible, which will be quite phenomenal. Um, and we're now, we've grown from August, uh, which is when we closed our Series A round. We've grown from three employees, and I think we hired this week our 26th. Uh, and it's the, the growth is phenomenal and it's super fun to, as a founder, all of a sudden have hired somebody that you haven't met yet before their first day. That's a crazy thing to even think about. Um, 
especially in the early days where, you know, it's you, it's just you. So hang in there. If you have an idea, you will form a team around you. Even if it feels like it's you, your, your co-founders against the world, um, keep at it, keep, keep pushing. Uh, it's been an absolutely wild journey. We're always hiring. As uh, Peter mentioned earlier, we, we do have a number of active uh, open positions right now. Uh, if you go to kasanacare.com, we have a jobs board there. Uh, hey, I'm, I'm sure. Uh, what was that? Excuse me. I think I'm I sorry. I'm sorry. Not on mute. My mistake. <laughs> no worries. <laughs> so, um, you know, Take, take a look at our website, reach out, and uh, I'm sure the folks at Venture Creations could also provide that information. Uh, but I uh, want to leave the last nine minutes or so for questions. I find that the most interesting part of these things. So if you want to post your questions in the chat, uh, I will work, I will do my best to answer them as they come in. Uh, and, you know, feel free to ask me about anything, whether it's my background, whether it is, um, you know, Kasana, what we're doing now. Uh, what it's like to to now have uh, two and a half offices, one in Boston, one in Rochester, and I say a half of an office in Connecticut because Austin has a facility there where we have a few employees um, because we're in the world of COVID. It's a challenging time to grow a culture um, remotely. So please ask away. Nick, just a question. Great presentation, a lot of really important points. Really, really, you've hit it out of the out of the park, actually, just about out of the state. Thank what you. Was your biggest challenge, and the second question is, what was your biggest oh wow? Um, so the biggest challenge was at the beginning. It was really challenging to look at how much capital I knew I needed, um, which was quite a bit. When you, when you look at the local um, entrepreneurship ecosystem, a $200,000 seed round is pretty normal. Um, you know, even uh, sometimes a little more, sometimes a little less. Uh, the, the friends and family round into the seed round, you know, maybe you've raised a total of 700,000. I needed, I thought 2 million for my seed round. And I'm very glad that I ended up uh, getting there, but boy, was it hard because you know, who wants to pony up $2 million when you have no revenue, when you have no team? Um, so that was really hard, especially given the riskiness of a medical device endeavor. Uh, if you don't get the regulatory process right, you're talking 10 years until you even are on the market uh, with all sorts of risks and expenses in the meantime. So um, that was really challenging. And I, I will say that one of the, the best things that I did was uh, after I got a million and a half no's locally, uh, I just went to Boston and I wanted to see what happened. Uh, and it, it was very interesting. And I, I don't say this um, to downplay the benefits of, of the local e ecosystem here, because boy, was it instrumental in me getting my story right. Uh, but I went to Buffalo and I got a big old fat no. You know, you are not ready to raise capital. You are not, um, you, you have a lot more refining to do, which I took race graciously because they all had great points. They weren't necessarily even wrong. Um, but then I went to Buffalo. I pitched the same pitch three days later. And I had, a, according to the one member, the best showing of any pitch in the last few years at the Boston Harbor Angels. Uh, and, you know, to me, it was just very interesting because that was a group that was very accustomed to investing in medical devices, uh, which really drove home Rich's point. There is an investor out there for you. And, um, you know, I think that finding that right investor is the hardest part. It's by far the hardest part. And it takes so much tenacity and, and dedication to do so. And then, um, Peter, your second part of the question was, remind me again, it was, the first one was biggest challenge. What was your biggest, oh, wow. Oh, wow. Um, I, I still feel it. Uh, it was the day that Austin uh, asked me to make my way to Martha's Vineyard to talk to the founder of General Catalyst. And uh, I met with him and uh, Austin and a, a slew of really phenomenal people. Uh, including who is now uh, Jeff Lydon, who's now our, our, the chairman of our board, who was the uh, CEO of Vertex Pharmaceuticals, who grew that business from an $8 billion or so pharmaceutical company 
to an, a 70 or $80 billion pharmaceutical company in only a handful of years. Um, <laughs> meeting with Jeff, meeting with Paul Sagan and Austin and, and David Falco, holy cow, those guys are top notch. I couldn't, I am still in disbelief that I was able to get an investment from one of the top VCs in the country, let alone have uh, a CEO like Austin. And uh, we have fun every day. Uh, a few weeks in, it felt like we were a family already, which I didn't even think was possible uh, with strangers coming together for me to hand off effectively my baby to. Uh, and it, it, it speaks to how well things can go when you work with those who have a, a high degree of integrity and ethics um, and, and operate above board. So this, the other question I'm reading, if a VC firms had an opinion on your medical device business being based in Rochester, positive, negative, neutral. Um, it's interesting because in a world of COVID, uh, you can't really be in the office anyway. <laughs> so uh, when, we were, when we were starting, there was the, you know, oh, we would love to be in Boston, but right now, you know, there's really nothing we can do about that. Um, but there, there's also some really great benefits. And one of the things that I actually think did impress VCs was the partnership we had with U of R. Uh, we worked really closely with them from the beginning. We worked on running studies through them. Even small studies go a long way to show that you can form a partnership. Uh, and that partnership has been really incredibly beneficial. And even now when we're in Boston and we're working with local hospitals in Boston, it takes a long time to get the ball moving on something like that. Uh, yet in Rochester, because we have that partnership, it, it, it goes a lot faster, which matters a lot for startups. Speed is king. Uh, so that was a really positive. Um, plus there's also the cost of living here, which is great uh, compared to other areas like Boston or, or New York City. Uh, the next question, what is the expected real retail price for the seat? So we are actually planning to go through uh, as a prescription device. The intention is for it to be covered by insurance and not something that consumers pay out of pocket for, at least in the near future. Uh, so we don't have an expected retail price for the seat. Um, but uh, the, the goal is to go after those who need it the most uh, in a setting where it's covered by their health insurance. So then uh, the next question, who are the economic buyers, end users, healthcare providers, insurance companies looking to cut healthcare costs? Uh, this is a challenging market uh, because while health insurance companies and other payers are really uh, the end customer, you know, the, the customer that seeks to benefit the most from this technology with long-term cost savings, it takes way too much um, evidence to convince them to pay for it on a large scale. So even though they are interested in using this preventatively to help reduce, for example, incidences of heart failure, um, and which could save billions of dollars, even within a single payer, billions of dollars, uh, the evidence required, you've almost already succeeded by the time you have that evidence. So uh, part of the challenge becomes looking for other avenues. And, and there's a few interesting ones in healthcare where you have at-risk organizations such as Medicare Advantage, which is to simplify things where uh, health, provider, health providers basically get a single fee per patient, regardless of how well they manage that patient, regardless of what kind of procedures they have to do. Uh, so that's incentivizing uh, these systems to do a really good job managing their patients. Uh, if you do a better job and keep your patients out of the hospital, you get the same amount uh, of reimbursement if they're in the hospital in and out for the next two years. So uh, that's motivation. And those systems are incredibly motivated to be looking at technologies like ours, where they can uh, hopefully reduce their cost. Uh, so it's, it's a challenge, um, but the primary challenge is actually getting through the FDA first. Um, it takes time. You have to prove that your device is safe, which we want to do, which we intend to do. Uh, we decided not to go the consumer route because we don't want to be thought of as a toy. We want to be a medical device. Um, so there are many people who are interested in buying this technology, um, but the primary hurdles are uh, integrating it into the clinical workflows and getting through the FDA. Um, so I, we're at time. And uh, I'll, I'm happy to take a few other questions, uh, Peter, depending on what you guys want. I've got five minutes, but it's, it's been great. Thank you for having me. Nick, we've got a pretty tough schedule, but I just want to say thank you for giving an incredible presentation. 
you are the poster child for the Venture Creations Incubator, and your biggest cheerleader is Rich all the time. So thank you for a great presentation. Good luck on getting to Unicorn. Thank you so much. And Rich, I couldn't do it without you. Thank you, guys. Thanks so much. Now we're going to go to the complete other extreme. We've explored getting your business prepared. Basically, we want to explore the idea of getting your business prepared to sell or merge. I've invited two of the folks from the Paramat Invest Paramax Investment Banking out of Buffalo. The two gentlemen we have here today are Tim Maniki and John Hawkins. Tim is the Managing Director and Executive Vice President at Paramax. He has advisory experience totaling more than $3 billion of transaction activity, both domestically and internationally. John is their Senior Vice President. He has 30 plus years of diverse experience, including roles as an owner and operator of several successful privately held firms. Prior to joining Paramax, John was the founder and president of a national HR outsourcing firm until he sold his interest in 2013. His company was a five-time award winner with the Inc. Magazine as one of the top 500 fastest growing companies in America and was also selected in 2008 as the number one fastest growing HR company in America. In the interest of full disclosure, this is the team that advised me in the sale of my company. So Tim and John, we've got a great audience here with a lot of senior executives and owners of their own companies. And they may not be thinking of selling now, and they may not be thinking of merging now, but you never know, and there are things that they should be aware of to prepare for the possible sale or merger. And so what I'd love to do is hear your thoughts and comments in terms of we've had Nick give an incredible presentation on starting and building a company. How do you get a company ready to sell or merge, and how do you maximize the value for the shareholders? It's all yours, guys. Thank you, Peter. Um, we're, uh, we're happy to be here, uh, Tim and I. Uh, special thanks to you, Peter, for the invite and to Jessica for all your hard work to, to get this taken care of. Tim and I are gonna talk today about two things which piggyback on each other. One is creating value in your business. And the second is preparing the business for sale. Uh, this is a topic that could go on for days. And uh, in fact, Tim and I talk about it for days at, at, at some point, but we're going to give you a hundred thousand foot view, uh, and we'll go relatively quickly because we only we have an, a half an hour. We're certainly able to hang on for questions at the end, um, and if you uh, if not, Peter knows where to find us if uh, if we uh, don't have questions. So with that, I'll I'd like to share a slideshow with you folks, and I'm assuming that it's shared as of now. You're good. Good. Okay. So with that, uh, we'll we'll dive into it, and I'll let uh, Tim lead off, and I'll jump. We'll jump in and out, off of each other. Tim, thanks, John. And, you know, I, I was thinking. I don't think I could have had a better lead-in than Nick's presentation. So Peter and Rich, thank you very much for that. And I start to think about valuation as a fairly complex topic, and I like to think of it as being a little bit of art. Uh, and a lot of science. But when I think about Nick coming in and pitching the fact that he has a toilet seat uh, for which is gonna be a health-related product, I, I change that concept a little and say, there's probably a lot of art and a little bit of science when you're talking about um, a, uh, an opportunity like that. And by the way, we see a fair amount of those. Uh, going forward. So thank you for that lead in. It's, it's a terrific way to get started here. I think if you understand um, the nuances of business value, I like to think of it as a pathway. And it's really a pathway as to how to create value, um, how to operate your business successfully along the way, and then ultimately, uh, how do you prepare that business for an ultimate transaction and, and transition down the road. So from a concept standpoint, I like to think about value um, in a couple of different ways. And the first value is really sustainability. You know, do I have the ability to survive in this company over multiple business cycles? So that's one way to look at 
the basis for a business valuation. Second way is really bankability. So how does how do uh, financial sources uh, create a value uh, such that you could leverage that business? So that's another perspective that you would have on valuation. I think back to Nick's comment um, in the next concept is really investability. How does the investment community look at valuing your business and providing you equity infusion into that uh, to take you to the next level? And then there's really monetization of the business, which is really how do I create liquidity in that business over, um, uh, over all the years that I've been operating it? And I think I would add to that as, as you think about the creation of value that you need to think about it and understand it from a buyer's perspective. And there are different types of buyers, certainly strategic and financial buyers, but how do they view value? So I think it's important as, as we go through this to, to keep that in, in mind as well. So when you, when you talk about value, then what, what are those drivers? So what, what are people looking at um, as a basis for how you create business value? And, and certainly the number one uh, view, but not the only view, is cash flow. And, and in our world, um, and I'll, I'll call it a lazy man's cash flow, we talk in terms of something called EBITDA, earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, and amortization. Uh, but there are other ways to look at uh, other items that drive value. Scalability is one of those items. The ability to exponentially grow your top line is a driver for value. Um, intellectual property, the actual know-how, proprietary know-how or patents, those are uh, value creators and drivers for value in a, in a business. And then of course, there's the intrinsic value of that business. What are the tangible, what's the tangible value of the assets that exist in that corporation at any given time? All of those are drivers towards uh, creating a view of business valuation. And, and the, the buyers are also looking at what risk factors uh, affect those drivers. So they're, they're heavily focused on what, what are the risk factors and, and how do they apply to those particular drivers? I think coming back to Nick's comment um, uh, in presentation, um, you, when you look at valuation, business value, uh, business valuation, you have to look at uh, what the life cycle of that particular business is. It makes a difference in terms of the way you approach uh, a business valuation. So if you're a startup or an emerging company, and that I'd classify Nick's company in that area, you're really looking at things like it's, a pre -rev it's at a pre-revenue stage. Um, things that become important are really, uh, what's the burn rate on that business over some period of time? What does that IP uh, or know-how look like? And is it protectable over the long run? And if it is, how long uh, do you think that could last beyond the first uh, patents that they're developing? And, and I think of it in terms, and if I would have known Nick's presentation, I would have put toilet seats here, but it's really a new cancer drug is a great example of an emerging opportunity. And you have to figure out how, how that might fit into a value proposition. Beyond startup or emerging entities, we have mature companies. Those are companies where you'd see solid recurring cash flow. They generally have a stable market and they're in that normal growth range uh, for whatever their industry is operating right now. They tend to have a strong infrastructure in place um, and that creates value for them. Uh, and an example of that would be, you know, a precision machining company that's been in business for a few years. Um, that's, that would be a mature type of a business. There are uh, growth businesses. So these would sort of sit in between startup and mature. Um, these businesses are highly scalable. So top line revenue is going to grow very dramatically over some period of time. They generally are developing new products and services. They tend to be outperforming the industry in some way. Um, an example of that is a SaaS software company 
and the value proposition for that those types of organizations again different than than businesses at other stages and then of course we have declining businesses so these are businesses that are lacking innovation management is tired maybe getting close to retirement there is a bit of stagnation and the question is is there a transition plan in place for companies like that and so you need to have that perspective is where does where does this company fit uh, when you're looking at a business valuation? Um, so next slide, uh, we're talking about you know how do you calculate value? And again, remember I said a little bit of art, lots of science. So this is really the science part of it. Um, and you know there are a couple of different approaches to value. The the first couple we sort of classify as market values. And so um, an EBITDA multiple or a revenue multiple are typical ways of valuing companies, um, depending on where they are in their life cycle. And those are generally driven off of data uh, regarding comparable transactions that occurred in the industry, trying to adjust um, your company to what those transactions looked like, the type of company they were, the size, um, the products and services that they're offering, and then come up with a comparable value based on um, um, that set of multiples. A very typical way valuations get done for companies that have been operating for a while. There's more, I would call them more theoretical uh, methods for valuing discounted cash flow is a primary one. That would be typical of Nick's business. Somebody will look at that. And the idea there is to try to project out uh, what does that company look like over the next five to 10 years, figure out what that cash flow is gonna look like, and then discount that stream of income back to today's dollars to create a value proposition. When Nick raised seed capital, somebody had to sit down with them and create a value for the shares of that company. And they most likely used, uh, at least as a primary source of valuation, a discounted cash flow model. Capitalization of excess earnings is very a very similar theoretical method. I won't go into the details on that, but think of it as another uh, method by which you're looking out into the future. And then there's a cost buildup. In other words, taking the tangible uh, value, fair market values of the assets that you have in, uh, in your company today and valuing those at the current market value. So those are just a few typical, there's a bunch more, but those are sort of the main ways that valuation, business valuation gets calculated. And although it's not a hard and fast rule, these typically, as Tim indicated, with, with Nick's business or, or are based on industry, for example, a manufacturing uh, business would typically use an, an EBITDA multiple where a uh, SaaS or an insurance uh, type business would use perhaps a, a revenue multiple. So it's, uh, it depends on the circumstance and the situation as well as, as the industry. And, and then you move forward from there. So I said initially that you know valuation is a little bit of art and a lot of science. Um, if the first slide, the last slide was science, um, these are the art items that exist as you're looking at a company. So these would be value impactors to um, how you create ultimately what you believe to be the fair market value of that business. Uh, one item and an extremely important item is working capital. And that really is what is the necessary working capital to operate that company over the long period? Not necessarily what that was there before, maybe, maybe more about what it needs to be in the future based on um, the performance of that company. So that's a very important item that takes a bunch of uh, work uh, to uh, determine uh, the impact on value. Customer concentration, very big one. If I'm a company that has, uh, you know, 70% of its business in a in one customer, that's going to be very different than um, if the largest customer is less than 2% of the, the business. 
um, to the extent that you have recurring revenue versus project revenue, that has an impact on valuation. Discretionary adjustments, um, all virtually all privately held companies run expenses through their P&L that may not necessarily be there uh, in the hands of the buyer. So we're always looking at what do those discretionary look like and how do we adjust them uh, for the performance of the company? Growth rates, an important item. If you're growing at 3% versus 20%, um, there's a fairly significant impact to that. The company size makes a difference. This is one case where size does matter um, to the extent um, uh, you are uh, producing a larger cash flow. Um, generally, the value of your company uh, would be worth more than a company in the same industry industry for a lower cash flow. Um, contracts are contracts um, uh, long term, or you work enough for purchase orders. That makes a difference. Capital expenditures, to the, are you a high CapEx company or a low CapEx company? That's going to make a difference. And then vicarious liabilities. And those would be the really the risk oriented around uh, your operation. Are you um, open or uh, have opportunity for litigation um, in the products that you're selling and the people and how you're manufacturing those kinds of things? I would I would add to that. I think one there's there's a lot of others as well. This is a, this is a good list to start with, but I think um, one that I would add that we Tim and I see often in a, in a significant number of deals is how uh, can the business operate without the business owner? And uh, far too often we see the business owner trying to push themselves and to show how how great and how important they are to the business, and that makes sense because that's typically what people do. They want to know. They want people to know about their contribution, but in the case of selling your business, that actually subtracts from the value. You want the business to be able to operate um, without you. Uh, if they need to replace you, then there is additional cost and additional risk. And if everything's attached to you as the owner, uh, that can certainly have an impact on the business. Um, I, I would also add, you know, Tim's mentioned a lot of things. We're talking about drivers. We're talking about metrics, life cycle, all types of things. There's no particular place to mention this, but it's really important that as a business owner, you have a realistic view of value of your company and uh, you don't overinflate it. We, we sometimes see people that think their business is worth far more than it is. Um, so you need to be realistic. If your, your friend got five times revenue for his SaaS business, that doesn't mean that you're going to see the same multiple for your business, which is uh, a smaller business and a commoditized industry with smaller margins. You know, you have to think like the buyer will think, and that would certainly be uh, worth less. So um, if we look at some trends, you know, two things that have effect on valuations, one has to do with industry um, and the other has to do with size of deal, which I mentioned previously. I, I put up a few uh, statistics that are fairly recent and you can see uh, certain industries. I've got um, you know, the telecom industry, I got healthcare, which would have been where Nick was falling, a distribution business and technology. And you can kind of see those are EBITDA multiples and how they've changed. I think the interesting one for me was how technology went from being really the high category back in 18, when it was very robust, technology uh, valuations were uh, fairly significant, and then it dropped in 2020. Um, but I will tell you, I, I just was working on a project, and the, the fourth quarter of 2020 actually rebounded for technology. So in the end, although uh, it got hurt a little bit uh, during the year, it seems like it recovered pretty quickly. But industries are gonna make a difference uh, in terms of um, how people look at valuations. Um, size makes a difference here and, and it's a fairly significant difference. And you can see that on the left-hand side are what we refer to as total enterprise value. In other words, the value of the company. So in companies that were sold in 2020 that were between 10 and 25 million, 
on average, those sold at about a six times EBITDA multiple. Um, companies that were 100 to 250 million sold at a, uh, an EBITDA multiple of 8.6. So well over a two times turn more merely as a result of the size of that company uh, going forward. So um, it does make a difference. And why is that? Generally, there's a sense that larger companies are um, better developed from an infrastructure standpoint. They're not so dependent, as John mentioned uh, earlier, on, uh, on a single person to operate that. And so that takes risk out of a transaction and the risk really uh, creates more value. The less risk creates more value. Okay, so we've said value is really the pathway to pre preparation. And so once you understand value concepts and you recognize those drivers, um, and now you can sort of measure the value or have a sense of the measure, then it's really shifting to how do you prepare uh, for a sale uh, going forward? Um, and what are those complexities that might exist in a transaction? And then how do you build a team around that to make that happen? I think Nick made a great point there, which will will reinforce going uh, forward. So yeah. we have about nine minutes left, so we'll we'll make sure we get through these. But one point I want to add before we get to this preparing for sale, that's critical. And Peter and I have talked about this um, for some time, and he wanted me to make sure that the point is made that preparing for sale doesn't happen a week or a month or even a year before you decide to actually exit the business. It actually starts the day you begin your business. You need to think about what you want your exit to look like and you build your business appropriately so that when the time is right, uh, you're ready to go. So prepare as if uh, it's for sale each and every year. So I, I think one of, the, one of the things I try to uh, ram home to business owners is, is good operating performance, great operators aren't necessarily ready for transactions. There's a whole nother level. I mean, you, you wanna be a good operator, but you also have to focus on what does it really mean in a transaction process? There are a lot of things beyond operation that in, investors and buyers are looking at. So you need to really understand them. Um, and I think when you're getting prepared, as John just mentioned, um, and I've, op I've owned and operated businesses over the years, and I learned sort of after the first one that I operate that business every year as if I was selling, whether I was selling or not, because I know that ultimately that created sustainability, it created bankability, it created um, the ability of, of investors to look at me, and then ultimately it positioned me. Uh, for a sale down the road. So it all made sense to operate in that environment. Um, we look at the, the, as John mentioned again, the, what we call a, the due diligence fire drill, and it's really a pre-sale checkup. So, you know, we've had, I've worked on 320 transactions in my lifetime. We've got the ugliest list of due diligence that you can imagine from all of those people. And we've sort of compiled that down and said, okay, these are the critical items in all the different disciplines um, that, you're, that we're going to get involved with. And let's make sure we take you through that as if we were the buyer and so that we don't find something later on. If there's something that's there, it's a red flag, we're gonna fix it beforehand, or we're gonna at least put a rope around it so that we can disclose it appropriately and not, not hurt us later on. And then, of course, once you've, you've uh, done the checkup, then you really need to fix and integrate and put the improvement plans in place for that. So as John said, you need a little bit of time to make that all happen. And I would, I would add one more piece to that, this, which is understanding your objectives for exit. And, and those are things that include your transition goals, what you would accept from a deal structure standpoint, what are you going to do with the real estate that may or may not exist? And, and one that I'll add is people don't even think about is if you have a partner or shareholders, are they on the same page as you? Because um, very often that is not the case. You get to the 
you get to the dance and one of you wants to dance and one of you doesn't. So make sure you understand upfront uh, what your partners, what dancing means to them and that it's exactly that you're dancing the same dance. I think that's uh, another critical piece. Um, I won't spend a lot of time here. You, I'm sure you all could uh, figure out what, um, what kinds of diligence activity is needed on all the different disciplines of the company. This is just a few of them to give you some, some sense of it. Why don't you keep going, John? Um, I think John had mentioned this. I think once you get through that, I think that's, that's really the time to refine your expectations. So now, if I thought going in my company was worth X and I found out it's most likely worth Y and I have a few diligence issues I need to deal with, let's make sure you reset that so that everybody's on the same page. Maybe you need to go back to work for a while to achieve your goals. Maybe it's more than you thought. Um, but, um, you know, don't go in without a good expectation for it. Um, you know, look at the, the deal, deal details like value range, the transition period. What are you going to do about key employees and what about the facilities? And then you have to really think about post deal issues, you know, your financial planning, your personal trust in estates, what's retirement life going to look like and managing the emotions of that. And what, what will those advisors look like for you after the fact? You know, um, the business is a life cycle and then you have another life after that you've got to plan for appropriately. Um, building a deal team. I, I, I don't think Nick could have said it any better. Um, if you go in uh, you could be the greatest operator in the world, but when you're going into a transaction, it's a whole nother ball game. And so you've got to build a team around yourself, whoever they may be, to help you get through it. And, and generally, the team includes you know, investment bankers, attorneys, accountants, and, and you want to keep a financial planner close at hand for that. And that team, you've got to have confidence in and, and help you get through the process. There are so many things going on at, at one time. There's no way you can manage all of that activity um, in, a, in a deal process. And it's coming at you high speed. You've got to make sure you're ready for it. And the last thing I would add, and this is our, this is our last slide, and we're happy to take questions as long as you'd like, Peter. But um, I, I think it's important that planning and uh, assembling your team and communicating your goals and objectives, objectives with them um, is not something you do, as I said, a week or a month before or a year before. The people that are successful do this years in advance, two, three, four, five years in advance. So that team can help help you plan, strategize, and execute your plan and uh, eventually exit. And everyone volunteer, everyone exits either voluntarily or volu uh, involuntarily. And uh, you, you'd like it to be the former of that. So plan ahead. We can take some questions, Peter, if you like. Actually, we're getting we're getting close to one o'clock. Okay. I just want to thank you. It's a great presentation, and I think what you did is really point out a lot of critical things that we need to keep in mind. We were not looking to sell, and again, there are a lot of a lot of folks in the room today that are listening to this that maybe have no intention of selling, but there are things that you can do just to prepare to make your business better. And the second thing is, who knows? You may get an opportunity, or somebody may make an offer like they did with us. And now you've got a decision to make. So now you know all the things that you need to do to get ready for that. So great presentation, guys. A lot of things we need to keep in mind. Um, with that, the other thing we'll do is put a link in tomorrow's reminder on how, you know, we'll have Jessica do this, on how to reach Nick's HR department. He's hiring, and that's fantastic. I want to thank again, uh, Tim. Uh, you did a great job coming all the way from Buffalo to do that. And John, appreciate it and appreciate all you've done to help me. And with that, we'll see you tomorrow afternoon. Steve Sasson, the inventor of the digital camera will be joining us tomorrow. I can't wait. So everybody, thanks again for the great speeches, a lot of good information and see you tomorrow with Steve Sasson. Cheers. Cheers, Peter.